Hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Marlene Weibner. I'm the South Coast Policy Lead for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And welcome to our Grace Harbor public meeting as part of the North of Falcon process. And um, as usual, I'll just give us a minute or so to reach a critical mass here and then we'll get started. Thank you. Okay, uh, it's been a moment since I've seen anybody new join. So I'll go ahead and get started. And as usual, we'll start with our Zoom meet call logistics and ground rules. Um, so you can turn your camera on and mute or unmute yourself through the control panel at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna keep everybody muted during the beginning of our program and then unmute folks when we open it up for questions and feedback. Uh, you can unmute yourself if you're on your phone by pressing star six. Uh, please raise your hand to ask a question and you can access this through the control panel at the bottom of your screen. And you can also raise your hand by hovering over your face or name on the list of participants. Callers can raise their hand by, by dialing star nine. <clears throat> please do be respectful of others. Uh, mute your phone or line uh, when you're not speaking and be tough on the issues here and questions, but not on people or, or organizations. Please don't pursue any personal attacks, insults, or threats. Make sure you're listening and speak and act professionally and allow for a balance of speaking time so everybody has a chance to share their thoughts. Um, we are recording the meeting. Um, and if you have any technical issues during the call, use the chat button and we'll help you through those. Um, we're gonna take your questions and comments live though as we wrap up our short presentation here. Um, so again, my name is Marlene Wagner. I'm the South Coast Policy Lead for the department. I'm joined today by Mike Sharp, the Grace Harbor fish biologist, and others to focus on Grace Harbor fishery proposals. So we have a couple of handouts um, uh, that we sent out earlier, and, and they're also on the website. And the presentation for tonight is also posted on their website. The first section tonight is just gonna be a review, especially for those of you who've been attending the meetings throughout the season. Um, so I'll just start with this general overview of the North of Falcon process. Um, first, we forecast the abundance of each stock. And from there, we determine if there is a harvestable surplus. And once we've determined that, uh, we can model the fisheries to determine which stocks are gonna be constraints. Uh, and we predict what we catch under different scenarios and circumstances. And this is sort of an iterative process that we are in right now. Um, and after this, we're going to negotiate with our tribal co-managers and with other states for sharing for, for the pardon me, for the sharing of these stock allocations. 
This is the rest of our schedule uh, for the remainder of the North of Falcon season for 2022. Uh, we're here tonight, April 6th. Uh, welcome. And we're going to go over some proposed fishing models and continue our discussions about fisheries in Grace Harbor. Um, uh, the final PFMC meeting also began today and is going to continue until the 13th of the month. Um, every link here, uh, link here on this page is clickable, and if you want to see the entire North of Falcon schedule, that's available at the link on the bottom of your slide. Here you can see the 2022 PFMC proposed salmon ocean alternatives. Uh, in March, PFMC set ocean alternatives for this year, and they're listed in this table for both Chinook and Coho. Uh, this year, because coho forecasts are up a lot from last year, we do have an intact fishery across all three options, uh, as opposed to last year when the low uh, or otherwise known as alternative three option was closed. And this slide, uh, slide shows us uh, how marine areas one through four annual ocean quotas are kind of distributed across the years from 2003 to 2021. And um, black dots, black lines represent non-treaty quotas, and the gray dots and gray lines represent treaty quotas. Uh, and you see Chinook here on the left and Coho on the right. We account for these fisheries uh, as we plan our terminal area fisheries in Grace Harbor. Um, so our 2022 management objectives have a, have a lot to do with our fisheries planning. Um, so the total adult return of Chehalis Spring Chinook is forecasted below their escapement goal. And so we're not planning any directed fishery uh, this year. Um, we have a meeting management thresholds for Hump Tulip Chinook, Chehalis Chinook, and Grace Harbor Chum Stocks. And so we're gonna continue to manage these to achieve our spawning escapement objectives. Uh, but we do have two stocks that have not met management objectives for three out of the uh, last five years. Uh, these are Hump Tulips Coho and Chehalis Coho. Um, so the total adult return of Hump Tulips Coho is forecasted below uh, numbers necessary to meet our spawning escapement objectives. So we'll plan to achieve the commission guidance uh, for this year's fishery planning with the 5% impact rate cap. Um, However, the forecasted return of Chehalis Coho is predicted to be over three times the spawning escapement objective. Um, so like Hump Tulips Coho, the adaptive management provisions of our policy, uh, 3621, uh, provides guidance that the impact of our managed fisheries in Grace Harbor would not exceed a 5% impact. Um, but we discussed this uh, in our last meeting and we're hoping to consider some alternative proposals. We're meeting with the fish committee tomorrow, uh, April 7th, to brief the commission on this matter. Um, so if you are interested in tuning in to hear this conversation, uh, the meeting does begin at one and the agenda is posted here. And our briefing for Chehalis Coho is gonna occur at the general discussion, current events section. Um, that's highlighted there in yellow. And so that um, should be the order that that meeting uh, uh, follows. Um, so at this time, we still have uncertainty as to whether we will be able to exceed this 5% impact rate cap. Uh, and so now I'm going to hand it over to Mike Sharp uh, to talk about Grace Harbor fishery proposals. Good evening, everyone. Um, next slide, please. So um, when we presented options at the first meeting, uh, we listened to what you uh, the public provided as comments back from some of those options that we had put together. And from those, um, we put together kind of a model option D, which is kind of a mixture of, of the preferred things that we've heard during that first meeting. Um, and I'm just going to run through this real quick. Uh, this was an, uh, something that was sent out, I think, last week. And so many of you have already seen it. But for those that haven't, this model uh, for the North Bay is, is the kind of the traditional August 1st through September 15th. And I want to apologize real quick. The handout that came out earlier today said, oh, this one still has it. I thought this was corrected. 
Uh, it says release wild Chinook. Uh, this was an oversight on my part. Uh, when I get into modeling, I tend to really focus on formulas and spreadsheets and not so much on uh, this attention to detail in, in these presentations, but this fishery uh, was modeled for a one fish release wild coho only. So it may say release wild Chinook, but it's not, it's release wild coho. And that was a recommendation that we heard from the public from last meeting. So again, August 1st through September 15th. East Bay, back to the traditional time period, September 16th through October. Uh, okay, I don't know. Oh, I got it. Okay, uh, sorry. Forgot what I had modeled. It's, it's a two fish limit in uh, September 16th through October 31st with re release Chinook. And then it drops down to a one fish limit in November release Chinook. And the lower part of the river on the Chehalis River below Fuller Bridge. Um, the jack fishery is there August 1st through September 15th. And then to match the bay, uh, that part of the river will open September 16th through October 31st with a two fish bag, release Chinook. Then in November, go to a one fish bag, release Chinook. And then in December, one fish bag, release Chinook and wild coho. Again, adjustments to what we presented before based on what we had heard from the public. So from Fuller Bridge up to South Elma Bridge, uh, this is just a small section, just the, the traditional jack fishery extends from 101 Bridge up to South Elma Bridge. So that's there, but from Fuller Bridge upstream, uh, we delay the opener to October 1st, and it's the same in the tributaries. October 1st through the 31st, two fish bag, release Chinook. November, one fish bag, release Chinook. December, one fish bag, release Chinook and wild coho. Hump tulips is the same as what we presented before in our meeting a couple of weeks ago. September, it's a two fish bag, release wild Chinook, or not, sorry, sorry, wild coho. So any Chinook, can be retained during September. In October, it's still a two fish bag, but only one can be a, a Chinook and then release wild Chinook and wild coho. And then November through December, one fish bag release all Chinook and wild coho. And um, to be honest, the commercial schedule is a, a very difficult one to put together um, currently because we haven't heard anything from the Quinaults at this point in time. Uh, my first take was um, trying to get some time a little bit earlier in the season. We don't have a lot of chum available. And uh, the later we go into the season, the more we in, uh, impact chum. So um, the season uh, pushed a little bit earlier. And, and with that, TangleNet uh, really helps to keep down the Chinook impacts. So I've got a and all of these in area 2A and 2D are 12 hour fisheries, daylight fisheries, typically uh, 6 a.m. to 12 or 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. or 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. But uh, during the first two weeks in October, one 12 hour day with TangleNet. And then the third, third week in October, move it to three, three 12 hour days with TangleNet. And then the fourth week in October, three days, three 12 hour fishing days without the need for tangle net. And then in area 2C, second week, now third week in October, three 24 hour days. The fourth week in October, two 24 hour days. And then the week of October, 30. 30th through November, whatever, uh, for 12, uh, 24 hour days. This package has a 18.27% impact on Chehalis Coho. Um, we are under the 5% on Hub Tulips Coho. We keep the 0.8% um, 
uh, impact during the commercial, non-treated commercial fishery in 2A2D below the 0.8%. And it's uh, basically a 2080 split between marine and freshwater. Very difficult to meet the policy guidance there under that, but I, I thought we would show it. So that uh, is what I think would be, well, it, it's my preferred option as we move forward, as long as we get commission guidance that we can exceed 5%. So what I wanna do now real quick is to go over some options that if we don't get the guidance, then, then what can we do? So if we go to the next slide, um, I've got four columns here. Um, last year's season, we all know what it is. It's sitting at 4.96%. And the splits between commercial, or not commercial, but uh, marine and freshwater sport, uh, certainly not in favor of the marine side, but it's 13 to 87%. Um, then what I wanted to do is just look at what could we do within that 5%? So I, I modeled a fishery that was just October only. And uh, as you look down, and, and North Bay and Hump Tulips, they were the same. They're the same as the Model D. So everywhere else, I left the um, jack fishery in in the lower Chehalis, but then started everything on October 1st and ended it on October 31st and used last year's um, commercial schedule. And that package alone was a 6.8% on Chehalis Coho. So just fishing in October not and, and not being a Normark Selective uh, would not meet that 5%. So I just, you know, what does November, December look like? So same structure, what does that look like? And, and it, that actually meets the 5%. If we just fish November and December, non-mark selective, but one fish. And, and I did do um, a couple of extra weeks in the East Bay because they only fish through November anyway. So that package actually opens October 16th. And if you look at down at the bottom, the uh, comparison between marine and for, uh, freshwater sport. It's really, if we don't, if the East Bay isn't open in sometime in September, their catch is really low. So I, I didn't know if that was, to me, that's not a great option, but I'm presenting it to, to show you guys what some of the difficulties are within trying to reach this 5%. And one of the other suggestions that we heard was reducing the number of days per week uh, to get to where we need to be. And so this last one is, uh, and I remember what I did. I did a whole bunch of things just to get down to 5%. So basically I took model C, which was just a one fish limit, and then applied the scalars that reduced the impacts based on days of the week that you close. And then cut out fisheries as I went until I got down to 5% and it was substantial. So what I came up with was East Bay opening October 1st through November 30th, just Thursday through Saturday only. Main stem Chehalis below Fuller. We have the jack fishery, but I couldn't get that thing open earlier than October 24th and then run it for one month on a one fish limit and then starting November 25th and run through December 31st. It had to be a one fish release Chinook and wild coho. So I had to go mark selective. Above Fuller up to uh, South Alma, we got the, the jack fishery, but from there upstream and most of the tributaries I could open it up October 16th, run it through November 24th, a one fish limit, and then beginning November 25th, go to Mark Selective for Coho. Um, so tributaries are the same except for Wishkaw 
in order to get to 5%, I just went mark selected October 16th through the December 31st because there's hatchery fish there. And then in the SATS up, I had to go mark selective November 16th through the end uh, through December to get to your 5%. So um, that's what we had to deal with. So um, with that said, I, I think I am at this point of just now, I think we'll, we'll open it up to uh, conversation and questions. And it looks like our first question is from caller ending in 793. I have made it so you can unmute yourself. Yeah, hello, Mike, this is Andy. So with your commission stuff, whatever you're gonna to present to them, because the policy is a guideline and this is where the policy was gonna muddle things up if there was a great abundance of fish. I mean, do you guys feel confident that the commissioners, the fish committee meeting could possibly say this was a guideline for conservation, but we have an abundant fishery. So throw caution to the wind because we have some in-season monitoring this year. Hey, you're hey, gonna bite on that. Hey, Andy, this is Kelly. Good to, good to hear from you. It's been a while. Uh, I don't pretend to know how the, the fish committee or the broader commission is going to respond to this. Um, we've, we've provided them a briefing document. We've shared with them our concerns associated with both the, the commercial restraints and uh, the rec restraints if, if, we, if we're not allowed to exceed this 5%. So I encourage you to tune in tomorrow afternoon to hear that conversation and uh, you know we'll, we'll all see how it goes. But uh, I, I, I don't know how it's going to go if I'm being 100% honest with you, Andy. Right. Yeah. No, I'm just curious if you had it and if you had talked to them previously or what they felt about if you presented something to them. So I don't know how it's going to go either, but I, the policy is just a guideline for conservation. And if we have all these fish, uh, all user groups should benefit from them. Yeah, I guess I guess what I would say to that is the commission policy is a policy that we're as staff and as an agency we're we're uh, obliged to comply with, and this adaptive management section is you know where this five percent uh, limit resides is part of that policy. So um, um, we are going to need an approval from the 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 entire commission in order to um, exceed that 5%. Yeah, okay, well, we'll see what they say. Otherwise, it sounds like it's gonna be a pretty meager season for everybody. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I, I believe I'm correct when I say that uh, the, the, the fish committee intends to take public comment on that. So regardless of, uh, you know, which, uh, which position you, you, you uh, you, re, you know, where you stand on this position, I encourage anybody and everybody who's interested to listen in tomorrow afternoon. Uh, the, the Zoom link is on our commission uh, uh, webpage. Uh, tune in and uh, 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 feel free to offer public comment. Thanks, Andy. Thanks. And our next caller is Travis. I have allowed you to unmute yourself. Hey, Mike, how's it going? I know we've been talking um, <clears throat> outside here, but one thing I'd like to point out, can you guys put up the previous options if they don't allow the 5%? There we go. Um, just want to put my input on that. I would strongly go, go against the Thursday through Saturday fishery. I'd much rather have like a November... November, December only, honestly, um, uh, than doing, just because the average working guy can't, you know, he'd only get one weekend day to fish, right? Um, which, and granted you get, you could get hit it in the afternoons, but it's, it's tough for a lot of people. And that's one of my big complaints about our fisheries in the ocean is only having one, you know, Sunday through Thursday type of fisheries, only one day to go salmon fishing on the weekends which i know is always a war every year out there 
Um, I know they're dealing with that at the PFMC meetings right now, actually. So um, other than that, you know, the December 1st through the, or November 1st or December 31st, I think that's a better option. Just if, if we can't get that, uh, get above 5% just because the fish are bigger and we have more hatchery fish that time of year um, that I've seen personally. So, um, and as far as commission goes, I don't, I honestly don't trust anything that's coming out of the commission right now, as I've already voiced my opinions about. Uh, as far as the meeting tomorrow goes, um, at one o'clock, I'm going to try to tune into that. Are they allowing public comment like this to that meeting, or are we just going to submit them online directly to the commission? Uh, kind of curious about that. Yeah, I think uh, the intent is to carve out some time for some some public comment, but that doesn't prevent anybody from from weighing in. And then I think there's also an opportunity during open public comment on Friday morning uh, to to share your 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 views. Okay, I'll try to hit hit one of them anyway um, and get our comment in there. I've been trying to talk with some of the other guys and some of my guide friends about what's going on with all of this because for some reason I can't seem to get very many people to tune in but uh there I think they're all in agreement with kind of what I've got to say uh, uh, what my opinion is anyway on our fisheries so I want to thank you guys for uh letting us have a comment and I'm pretty happy with what I see here as far as you know especially if we can get that 18 percent impact rate that would that that's a fishery that I would definitely stand behind um, for the for the upper shingles anyway. So yeah, thanks. Um, anyways, that's I think that's the only comment I got so far. So I guess we'll listen to see what other other people have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. And our next hand is from Eric. Eric, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, good evening. Uh, my question is a simple one. Um, when you're talking about the fish committee meeting and then the commission having uh, the discussion about whether to exceed the 5% allowance, is there a firm date when they'll decide? Did I miss that or that's my question? Yeah, thank, thanks Eric for the question. My, my what I believe to be true is that, um, so, so PFMC starts tomorrow. Um, if we're going to receive this guidance from the commission, we need it, we need it sooner rather than later to allow us to enter into these conversations with co-managers for the salmon season setting process and negotiations. So, so from that perspective, it feels like the rubber's going to hit the road probably Friday morning, uh, with, a with the conversation with the commission. Beyond that, there's probably not much opportunity. Um, you know, it's not, uh, it's not impossible, but our hope is that we get uh, direction one way or the, the other from the commission on uh, Friday morning. All right, thank you. you bet. I love that. And our next hand is from David. I have made it so you can unmute yourself. Howdy. Um, uh, not sure where to tackle this thing at. Um, the, the gentleman who put forth rather fish in November and December than anywhere else, he's pretty obviously, he doesn't fish tidewater or anything below Fuller Hill because November you're pretty well blown out. That's where the rains and mud start and that takes the bay out. So the main, main fishery early on is September and October. October, you're gonna have every coral that's got a net in the river with the forecast. And so you're probably gonna be in the, if, uh, anybody above the 101 bridge, you're gonna be fishing behind nets four days a week, October. So it's always been our best week to fish tidewater up to Fuller Hill is September. With the last two weeks, as Mike used to describe it, expensive, because that's where we can catch the most because we haven't got the nets parked in front of us. 
more fish, more caught. That's kind of how it works. It's not just straight up. <laughs> As to anything else, uh, I do not understand why you guys are pushing one, two fish limit. It strikes me as a bit absurd. Uh, you're, you're, you're pushing hard on an assumption the run's going to be bigger. I assume it will be, that you won't be totally wrong. The other side of the coin is it doesn't, uh, we, everybody's always said we'd rather have a full season than a larger bag limit. And quite frankly, if you're going to talk uh, that, you want to start the season for, for uh, above the bridge, 101 bridge, uh, September 1st. If there's, if there's enough fish for two coho, you can take it back to one. And you could probably map, map it out because without the model, I sure can't do it. Um, you could probably darn near start at uh, August 1 or August 15th if you just kept one coho and release Chinook. And make sure you do the release Chinook pick for the jack so somebody don't get surprised again. <laughs> Remember, we, <laughs> yeah, I won't say who it was, he was a little surprised. So <laughs> you can get caught by the regulations. But to me, if we're, if we're gonna go through the 5%, and uh, uh, by the way, uh, where you have to have permission from the commission to go above or below on the policy, that's not true. It's guidance. Uh, it was made very clear when this was put in and I participated. It is strictly guidance. It's not in a whack. Nobody can sue you if you don't follow it. The commission can ream you if they want to, but they can't tell you what to do. Okay, it's guidance. Okay, it was intended to be flexible. That's what the adaptive part is. I would say uh, if you had a run of maybe 10,000, 20,000 above escapement, you're, that's, not a, that's not nothing that you, you do with. But with the run forecast you got, um, it's an outlier year, and you should be able to take advantage of it, both rec and commercial. But I also think you should do it in a conservative manner. Just don't go hog wild and throw caution to the wind. So for me, it, and the three, the three, the three, the three trips, the Wainuchi, the Wish Call, and the Hokim. The Hokim should not be open at all. It should be shut down. Okay. The wish call with the hatchery fish in there. Yeah, okay, do do mark selective like you suggested, Mike. And the Wainuchi is in the same boat. Okay, these streams haven't even come close to escapement for so long to throw a two fish limit on them or even a one fish limit, it, it's absurd. Okay. Uh, I mean, like the what was it? I think the 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 wish call was 20% of escapement. We got no business even messing with them, okay? As except for uh, Mark Select. So to me, Mike, I would like to see something modeled that shows us a full season and a full season runs September 1 through November, okay? Uh, any, any cutbacks for the protection of fish should take place after December 15th and we shouldn't even be on the water then. Uh, maybe on the main Chehalis, but after that, no, because you got the two, the mid fish going up above, and you got the 150 lates that are come that were planning uh, coming back to the Satsa. But when you got runs that are so far down and beat up so bad, see, maybe fish them on the Chehalis up and down, because the upper basin, especially, because that's their run timing, but down low. We got no business going after those those lake coho. We've done so damn much damage to that stock. It's not even what I would call a red face test. I mean, it's just pretty terrible. So I guess mine is one fish. You guard those three, four trips down low that have been pounded, especially for the lake coho. And you, instead of having a two fish limit, go forward like when our August 1st jack fishery starts have the jack fishery, and you can keep an adult. I mean, if we can, if you can do two fish, I don't know what the math says, Mike, only you do, 
So I would say uh, people have always said we'd rather have a full season than a bigger bag. And uh, a full season at a minimum for us has always been September 1 through, well, in not in recent times, but when we had them. Uh, but uh, there was, a, you know, it, it depends where your spot and time is, okay, uh, what it is. But it's better to, to fish the, the whole damn season on a one fish bag than go out there and just try to get them on a two fish bag. It's just, it gives everybody, especially the working guy. I heard somebody mention the working guy. The shorter the season is, the more he's screwed. The longer you stretch it out, even if we have to take a, a shorter bag limit, the more people it will have access to and the less the crowding problem will be. It's just, uh, it's just people and math. Okay, and now I see Kelly's there. And Kelly, you're, it's not set in a whack. I sat through those meetings with every commissioner there yeah, and uh, it was made very clear, and especially with a couple other issues in another place, the commission's guidance is just that guidance. It's yeah. not in a whack. You can go past them if you want at your own peril, I guess. <laughs> so what anybody would say is, it's pretty bad to punch the traffic cop in the nose and then ask him how come he's giving you a ticket. So, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah Dave. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I appreciate what you're saying. You're, you're absolutely right. You know, our policy is, you know, is an RCW. It's not Washington Administrative Code, but it is, you know, it is commission policy. And as, as somebody who's held the department's feet to the fire for um, uh, not, you know, your perspective, not following commission policy. I hope you can appreciate the fact that <clears throat> we never want to get sideways with our commission. So we want to have this conversation with them. I'll let Mike talk about the bag limits and the tribs and all that. He's the expert on that front, but I just want to be clear, you know, as, as, as somebody who is instrumental in the development of this policy and who's been really active with our, with our commission over the many years, not just with this policy, but, um, uh, another one comes to mind. Um, uh, you know, I think what I'm hearing you say, and I'm just checking in on that to make sure I'm clear, is that you'd be okay with us uh, um, going to the commission and making this request. And you'd also be okay if the commission decided to give us some, some additional flexibility within the policy. Am I right actually, about that? Actually, absolutely, because okay. as you got to realize, I guess, but... <laughs> Yeah, I hate to get in the sport commercial thing. And the thing about it is, is this, is when we went through that whole process and it, you know, yeah, I, I, the Willow Paul process, I don't even want to talk about for Grace Harbor, it was different, but it was, it was, it was always when you got right down to the fine line, it was made very, very clear by staff and everybody else that the, 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 the commission's policy is guidance, period. Okay. Not now, arguing that. But at the same time, is like I said, it's really not considered a good idea to punch the traffic cop in the nose and then try to drive away without getting a ticket because you're probably going to jail before you get the ticket then. So, yeah. And so that's what I'm saying is if you, if this is an outlier year, you're in three, five, we've been down and now we're on the up cycle. That was always going to happen with the three, five. It's been talked about among us. A lot of people were involved in the process for a long time. We knew that sooner or later with coho, we were going to crack into this because coho cycle up and down so fast. Okay. And you can, you're, you're always missing them on, on the upside, downside. There's just an absolute pattern over the year. So we knew what happened. And so this is what the adaptive part was about. I wouldn't say the adaptive part says you just throw the whole policy to the wind. No, I would say you walk in and present it in a very, very conservative manner as we think we got a good run forecast. We're in the three, five. We, need, we feel that we should be able to use a part of that in a safe and sane manner to give better seasons under the adaptive management part. And that would benefit both not just rec or not just commercial, it should benefit within the policy guidelines, how they're laid out, okay? <laughs> so after that though, but two fish bag to me is simply just, <coughs> it's abhorrent because you're taking an opportunity 
with the outlier year. And instead of approaching it cautiously, you just thrown it the wind and we're gonna go out there and just kill fish as many as we can if it fits in the model. And by the way, if somehow, some way between all this this year, we blow coho escapement, I guarantee that when the, that I can bring 20 people to the commission meeting the next time around and there'll be hell to pay. There should not be any chance left under any circumstances that we fail to make chum or coho escapement. There should not be anything even proposed that we don't, that you aren't absolutely confident without fear of contradiction, short of an act of God, that we can fail to make escapement. That is our, what we, that's the, the heart of the policy. That's what the adaptive part was in, to allow you to make movements where it was not ordinary, okay? And this is not ordinary, it is, it's an unusual occurrence. And it could happen next year, I don't know. So my point is one fish limit and give us back our damn summer fishery as far back as you can make those numbers work, Mike. Now, the only thing we got that it could interfere with that would be, other than the number, would be Chinook. And we're never going to have a Chinook season on the Chehalis, not as long as Alaska and BC and, the, every, and everybody just lets them butcher our stock to death. Okay. So if we're, we use our Chinook numbers strictly for release mortality, well, let's take our coho forward as far as we can with insanity and let's have a full season, one fish and guard the three lower tribs that are in such dire straits. That's a pretty straightforward conservative approach. And I'll shut up before I annoy everybody. Hey, I, I appreciate the thoughtful comments there, Dave. Much appreciated. Thank you. And our next hand is from Garrett. Garrett, you can unmute yourself. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. Hey, thanks for providing this meeting, you guys. Hey, uh, first of all, I'd like to show my support for option D that you guys are, or model D. Um, I think that it provides a good widespread season for the entire basin, both marine and freshwater areas. Um, it's still a little on the conservative side with us going one fish in November. I think that's a good thing. Um, you know, I remember last time we had runs this size, we were running two fish bag limits all the way through November. And uh, if my memory serves correct, we even had a three fish limit one year. So um, I think that's good. Um, if we do not get the approval from the commission to exceed 5%, I think that maybe we ought to look at some options, uh, maybe even a Model E, Model F. Um, I think, uh, I think you guys did a good job looking at your different models, you know, trying to achieve that 5%, um, like in October or November, but, um, inevitably if we go with, with a strict, like, um, a season that follows a timeline, like in October only or November only, um, if we go with an early season, um, a lot of the guys on the upper base and, you know, uh, fishing on a lot of the skook fish, you walk and fish in the upper Chehalis, those guys, you know, if we don't have the right water conditions, they won't, they won't get good opportunity until November some years. Um, and then vice versa, if we go with a late fishery, November, December, uh, you're really, you're really not allowing the guys in the guys in the bay and the tide water to really get a good fishery in. Um, some years the water's blown out by, by mid October and those guys are kind of done for the season. So, um, I guess we'll just have to wait and see how that goes. And thanks for taking my input and uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Garrett. And our next hand is from Tori. Tori, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name's uh, Tori Johnson, live in Olympia, and I appreciate the time you guys have taken to, uh, to uh, listen to our concerns. I have a, a question first, and then I have some comments, and the question is to Mike, excuse me for being naive, can you explain the 5% option and what, that, what the 5% is? 
Yeah, I can do it real quick. Um, for, uh, 2014, was a policy was developed, a uh, commission policy to provide guidance to the agency on how to develop fishing seasons. And part of the adaptive management principles within this policy said that if a stock did not achieve its escapement goal three out of five years, that oh, okay. um, the agency would implement a 5% uh, impact limit on that particular stock. Okay, thank you. And then I guess my, my comment is, um, uh, I don't understand why, you know, I guess we're looking at this reduced days, weeks, when we're talking three times the escapement this year is expected. Um, you know, in the last 20 years, 30 years that I've fished this fishery, we have lost so much opportunity out in the, in the estuary. You know, 2009, we lost our Chinook retention. 2015, we lost two thirds of our area going from buoy 13 to buoy 27. Last year, we lost 15 days of the season. And then now with this reduced days, weeks, you know, we're losing 60% of our fishable days um, by going Thursday through Saturday. It makes it really tough for a weekend fisherman like myself, um, especially when the estuary is a tidal influenced fishery. You've basically got an hour before, an hour after high tide to catch your fish. And you, with an October one start, you basically have two good days out of the whole month of October on Saturdays to fish those incoming tides in the morning. So it makes it really tough for just a, you know, working person like myself to, um, to fish those days. So I would definitely go with option D um, and push that. Appreciate it. Thank you. And next we have a caller ending in four, two, five. You can unmute yourself. Hey, it's Francis Escalila. Uh, I too would support uh, option D or, or uh, model D. Um, I think it's pretty well thought out, gives a fairly generous season uh, with uh, a lot less sorting than we had to go through. I know that was a real punishment for the guys upriver last year. Um, if there's concern about throwing caution to the wind, uh, it really is not the case. We're leaving more than an entire escapement on the table. Uh, the rest of the audience may not, you know, I don't know if it was presented tonight. Uh, I couldn't get my Zoom app to run on my, uh, my computer tonight. So I'm just doing this by phone, but I do have in front of me a copy of uh, Model D uh on the on the excel, excel spreadsheet and you, know, you can see where the impacts fall yeah it's 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 18 plus percent on uh wild coho impact but even at that there's 38,000 wild coho uh unharvested uh with an expected escapement of 66,000 i mean we got to screw up pretty bad on our forecasting to not make goal, even at 18%. So uh, I'm comfortable with it. If, if you do get the uh, green light from the commission, I give that uh, my support. Um, uh, I, I don't think you have to go all the way down to a one fish bag until uh, later in the season when we do have concerns about uh, wild coho. And then we also have that I know it's not, it's a salmon meeting and it's not about steelhead, but we do have those concerns in, in December about steelhead, which forced the closure this last year. Um, so again, I, I, I have no problem supporting uh, Model D. Uh, in the event that the commission puts the kibosh on that and says, nope, we're gonna stick with 5%, it's there and they feel it's written in stone and they have to stick by their guns. Uh, I would actually favor last year's season. If we have to go with 5%, we put a lot of time and effort into putting that together, but I think it gives the greatest opportunity for, number one, the longest season possible, uh, but also opportunities for every user group from the bottom to the top to have a chance at catching some fish. Yes, 
uh, the guys that probably pay the biggest price will be um, the guys not able to keep wild fish and having to sort through so many, but you know, they're going to get great action. Uh, uh, it's in, in the end, it's fishing. Um, a successful trip isn't always about the meat in the box, although I'd say for the vast majority of folks, it's, it's kind of nice to have meat in the box, but uh, in the end, it is sport fishing and the greater the opportunity we can provide, I think last year's season actually provides the biggest and most diverse suite of opportunity for all the users in the basin. So I would throw my support behind that one um, if the commission says no to exceeding the 5%. I'd be happy to take any questions if my comments have ruffled any feathers. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. And our next hand is from Melanie. You can unmute yourself. Hi, it's Melanie. I'm gonna let Bob start and then when Bob's done, I'll continue. You can hear us, right? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Great. You know, in relation to the last person, uh, I I agree pretty much with the Model D projection, but if I'm not mistaken, Model D doesn't uh, make that 5%. It exceeds that, from what I understand from Mike. And if the commission doesn't go for that, the only thing we have left are the other proposals. Last year's season would not cut it. Is that correct, Mike? Um, you're right in that D will not make it. It's an 18 point uh, something percent. No, not, uh, yeah. Would last but, seasons make it? Because Yes, because that's what we had to deal with last year is we had a 5% max rate on a, a lower forecast. So last year's season would meet the 5%. Okay. <laughs> well, I guess that's better than nothing if that it comes down to. The rest of the projections I see here are are very restrictive, especially the reduced days a week one. Uh, you know, my concern is that we've only been fishing this river for a dozen years or so. And in all that time, I can't ever recall being able to keep adult salmon starting September 1st. So maybe returning to the good old days isn't really an applicable uh, solution at this point, considering that our runs aren't what they were 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So that's my position on an early opening. I think the opening should be September 50, September 15th, because the bottom line is, is that, uh, as I've stated many times, when you open that up October 1st, you really run the risk of an early rain blowing out the majority of the run. And the only people that benefits are the upriver people. And I understand their concerns, but last year they couldn't only keep hatchery fish which shot that all in the foot. So I really like uh, proposal D. I could live with one fish instead of two fish if that would likely make the commission more likely to okay exceeding the 5%. Uh, I do have another question that isn't directly related to these management proposals. I spoke to Brian today and was told that there would be someone tonight, and I'm not sure if it's Kelly or not, that would be able to tell us the current state of funding for looking at the Montesano launch to prepare that for the fall fishing season. And uh, that is of a concern because that also affects a lot of fishermen that fish this particular fishery. And we're just wondering how funding is going for that. If you are looking into emergency grants, uh, after speaking to Brian Calkins today, he did inform me of some stuff, but then he said that there would be someone tonight to help answer those questions. And I'm hoping that's you, Kelly. Yeah. Hey, uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. I'm having some internet issues. So Brian and I didn't connect today. So <laughs> uh, you're catching me a little bit off guard. I'm happy to, to connect with Brian and our lands folks uh, in the wildlife program who manage our lands and our, our access sites and uh, get, get back to you. But I don't have that information for you tonight. I apologize. Okay. 
I know that he said that the Department of Transportation may be involved in the latest funding talks because ultimately, if that blows out more, then that ultimately may change the course of the river around one side or the other of the bridge. And that would be a, a much more expensive proposal to deal with than what we're dealing with now. So yeah. those are my concerns concerning the launch. And I guess I'll have to speak to Brian more about it. But I think that it behooves us all to keep everyone posted as to the progress on securing funding for this before we get into the summer months and we're still arguing about where the money is gonna come from. This was yeah. obviously an emergency situation with a flood and it needs to be approached that way. But that's yeah. my, those are my, my comments on all of this. And I'm, I'm sorry to take up everybody's time with such a trivial issue as the biggest boat launch on the <laughs> Chehalis. No, please, please, don't, please don't apologize. Maybe Mike might have some more information than I have. Um, so I, I should have I turned it over to Mike right away. Mike, do you know anything mm -hmm. about no, I was hoping you knew a little bit more than me, but I spoke, <laughs> I spoke with the acting director of Region 6 today, um, and he, he, he indicated that, uh, one, DOT is definitely going to be involved because of the bridge, but he also uh, let me know that he assured me that the launch will be open um, by um, Oct August 1st when the season opens. Uh, he wasn't sure how much parking would still be available. So parking might be a premium. So uh, that, that, that's something to think about um, if, if things get worse. And, and we also talked about the fact that the flooding season that might not quite be over yet. So um, the, the acquiring funds is probably not uh, at that point yet, just to see what might happen between now and and say when the spring showers subside a little bit. So it, it's a, to be announced and you're right, we need to keep everybody uh, informed on what's going on there. Well, thank, thanks for that, Mike, that's, that's good. I was, at least we don't have another thing to blame former uh, regional director Larry Phillips for. So it sounds <laughs> like progress is being made and we'll make sure to keep folks up to speed on, on where we're at with that. Thanks. Well, you're considering Larry's new job. I figured he'd be in here raising hell. <laughs> Give him time. He's just getting his feet wet. I'm sure that my phone's going to start ringing any minute now with uh, complaints about what we're not doing right. I'm sure it'll happen. Rest assured. You got all the inside for information. Look out. <laughs> but I appreciate it. And now it's Melanie's turn. Okay. So um, I'll stick with that conversation and then switch back to the fish since we're still prime on that. Um, um, thank you for the update with the DOT. That's wonderful. Thank you for keeping this in the prime of your focus because it is super important. This is the way into this fishery. Most of us use it. Um, um, I'm curious if we're going to have issues with parking. Could somebody talk to the lumber mill and see if we could secure a little bit of time with them when their parking may be open and um, um, work out something with them? Because that parking lot sometimes is available. Um, just a thought. Um, back to the proposals. Um, I like what you've done with um, 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 the, the D proposal. I think you've taken the best of all of what I've seen and combined it into one good job, Mike, in trying. Um, I like the two fish. Um, I'm greedy. At this point, my attitude is that if we don't take them, somebody else, starting with Q, will. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I understand the conservation aspect and I understand the philosophy of negotiation and going to the um, powers that be and ask for only one rather than two, because that would be more um, correct and, and show um, some respect. Um, restraint, but um, I like the two fish and my attitude is, is that if we don't take them, they will. Um, other than that, um, thanks again. Um, good job. I'll see if I can get online tomorrow to be involved in that one. I've got some other appointments, so I don't know my status. 
So um, um, I've got my fingers crossed. And then when we have our next meeting, you'll tell us the good news. <laughs> One last thing. I have been told by a Quinault Fisher through a longtime Fisher who knows him well, that if you open on September 15th or you open on September 1st, but they weren't, they hadn't heard about a September 1st proposal, of course, because it's not in any literature, but he has been told that they will set nets before September 15th. So just a heads up on that. And I, I personally, I, I think that's about par for the course, considering that they did that to the commercial people last year. So just my last thought. And I might follow up on that a little bit. Uh, I look back on a past when we had big coho forecasts and, you know, it, it, it is um, what the Quinaults will typically do is front load their season a little bit to, to maximize their harvest on coho. I think that's called low holing. <laughs> yeah, but, folks, I don't I would want to use any terms to get anybody worked up. Hey, folks, I, you know, I, I appreciate the, the passion and uh, the the perspectives. I, I'm hoping we can keep this conversation focused on our fisheries. Absolutely. And, 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 and once, once again, uh, you know, that's why I understand why you guys want to do the one fish, but, you know, um, whatever we can have, that would be great. Good job. Yeah, thanks for the feedback. And our next hand is from Travis. Travis, I have allowed you to unmute yourself. Hey, Mike, it's me again. Um, just, I just want to clarify when I'm saying that I want the November 1st through December for 31st, that would be an upriver fishery, um, up, you know, upstream of South Elma. Basically that Oakville to Centralia um, type of area is where I'm going with that. I understand that the guys in the lower river need, need um, their season opened up a lot sooner. So um, I just wanted to clarify, clarify that so that, because uh, a couple people had commented that that would be too late for them, but that's, all, that's really all I got to say. I'm kind of, I'm definitely on board with option D, um, but uh, as far as the late, late, later season for us upriver, I think would be beneficial in my eyes anyway if we have to stick with that 5% stuff, so. Got it, we have it noted. All righty, I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you, Travis. And that was our last hand for right now, so I'm gonna remind people on the phone to um, star nine to raise your hand. And um, if you are having trouble finding it on your computer, you might want to look at the reactions tab. It looks like a smiley face with a plus sign at the bottom of your screen. And it looks like Dave Hamilton has his hand back up. You can unmute. I'm still trying to figure out where the controls are. Um, uh, uh, I'd like to, uh, what Travis is saying, the upper basin seasons are uh, always different than the lower and that and that uh, there's a couple reasons springers is one they got to clear and the second is unless that water temperature drops every any chinook female you hook is a dead doggy right on the spot we brood stocked and we've done that and we then we've got it we know exactly what happened so you can't get a the upper basin can't fish early just because Unless you can keep them, they're going to die. It's just the way it works. Once the water temperature drops, you're okay. And so that's why you got the seasons have always been staggered going up and they fish later. Plus, their hatchery fish are all late time. That's the scoop mitigation fish, and they're going three different places. So, you know, it's like two different worlds, same river, just happens to be tide water upstream it's just the way it works so but um on the on the if, if the if the commission doesn't want to do anything adaptive uh i i i don't i'd say just go with last year's whatever we did last year 
uh, unless you can figure out a way to cover that down week. Uh, but otherwise, uh, the day thing that I suggested days of the week, well, that the way you've got it lined out doesn't kind of work, but I know you're working around numbers I can't see. So, uh, you know, it, there's, it, it, it can or cannot work. So November, December, October only, I mean, <laughs> basically to be absolutely honest, is if we're gonna stay, if we have to stay with five, we just have to stay with what we did last year. There's not much way to get around that. It's going to take a week or so of us out and everything else. As far as the nation, I worked with the nation fishermen. Evans, they fish, they're right around my front yard and do use my dock for God's sake. So uh, the thing about the nation is, uh, and, and it's going to be non-treating. Everybody's kind of missing this. The nation hasn't said where they're going to fish yet. Mike alluded to that. And believe me, they're gonna go after their fish and they're gonna go after it with everything they got. So this big number that's left that, that uh, Francis was talking about, that big number ain't gonna be there. That's only there because you ain't seen the quinol season yet. And they're gonna eat a chunk of that. The only thing that's gonna hem everybody in, to be honest, is Chinook in the front and Chum in the back. So, if you look at that, the Quinaults can't go too early or they'll blow their butt out of the water right in the middle of their coho season. They can't go too late or that does the chain. Same, and the same for the NT net. So everybody, even the wreck is getting, unless we change, the commission agrees to do something besides five, and I still say one fish, damn it. There's no reason to be greedy. And it, it, it's just, uh, Everybody's going to be zeroing in on the, it's going to be the, the last week of, our, of September and the first three weeks of October. And you're going to be zigzagging around nets no matter where you go. And people, I mean, it's going to be crowded out there. And so where everybody thinks we got with that, there's so much escapement that's going to happen with this run forecast. You ain't seen the quote all season yet. And that number ain't going to stay like that. Okay. And so, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 it, it, this is going to, there is a five week window where this is all going to take place. It's going to be, depending on what the weather does, uh, the last week of September, maybe the third week, and the first three weeks of October. And everybody's going to be crowded into one little room. And I'm not exactly sure how it's going to pay, pay out. So, uh, if you fish tidewater, it's going to be about a three-day-a-week fishery, okay? If you fish the bay, you're in front. If you're behind and upriver, depending on what it does, you're going to it's, you're going to revolve around those four days of commercials of one size or the other, okay? So everybody should understand that when you see all these two fish limits and all this stuff and everybody think it's like just wonderful, it's not just wonderful. I'm kind of amazed Mike put together what he did because I'm he's threading a needle. Everybody thinks this is really an easy thing. He's threading a needle on this thing. If ever if somebody really screws up someplace and we blow escapement on coho, claiming it's an outlier year, or do it a chum, we're really gonna make a hemi mess out of ourselves here. And so there should be. You know, it, it's kind of like environmentalists. Everybody's an environmentalist as long as somebody else pays the bill. Well, everybody's a conservationist as long as he gets his fish and the other guy don't. Well, conservation is double-edged sword. You do it in good times and bad times. In good times, you're still cautious. In bad times, you're more cautious. So right now, we're in between. We need to be cautious. If for some reason we blow Chinook, Chum, or Coho Escapement, let it fall on the tribe, not us. We didn't do it. And that's what that's how we need to approach it. Simple really, as that. Really appreciate your comments, Dave. There's a lot in there and a lot of good points there. Uh, did want to say that uh, I would be happy to go over um, those, those uh, scalers of reduced uh, days per week. Um, if you would like to just kind of sit down and see how those all work out, I certainly would like to share that with you.
Okay, I'll give you a jingle. All righty, I will be. I up barely there. made it to this meeting tonight. I was busy chasing a blown water line. That was fun. Uh, doesn't sound like fun, but I will be up at the PFMC over the weekend, so I will be just, available. Just um, give me an email or something. We'll we'll take care of it, Mike. Don't worry got about it. it. Okay. I'm just trying to say, guys, is I've done this for too many years. I mean, I've been around the agency for 50 years. Okay. And I was around the rivers all my life. And every time that we thought we were smarter than the fish or mother nature, we found out that we really weren't. Okay. And, and I, I just, uh, I think it's not be, it's not becoming of us as a community rec or commercial to see the, to, to abide by the policy and you guys have done it strictly and nobody's claimed any fouls or nothing that when we hit the adaptive section and something like this, we should be proceeding with the same conservative objectives that the entire policy has placed us in all along. We take advantage of what nature's offered us, but we don't run amok, okay? It's just pretty simple. We can be conservations and harvest. We just can't kill everything we come in contact with. I'll shut up. Thanks, Dave. Um, our next caller is our next hand. Oh, they lowered their hand now. If we don't have any more hands, oh, Bill Osborne, he just re raised his hand. I have allowed you to unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Bill. You got to put a time frame around Dave. Dave and I talk every day, and I know what he he can go into an hour on this bit. Uh, I have two things I'd like to talk about. Uh, everyone seems to assume that above 107 to Fuller, it was just last year that we had hatchery only. I would like to remind everybody, it's been two years now that we had hatchery only above 107. And, and uh, uh, it's not that I, I didn't have any problem getting my hatchery, but I had to go through quite a few wild. And I know a lot of people went home without fish uh, because we didn't have a, a wild, uh, uh, a one wild fish up there. And my second thing I'd like to talk about is the, the forgotten fish. And Mike mentioned it, and I listened to the whole Willow Paw thing last night. The word Jack never came up at all. I have a thing about Jacks because I, I watch how many go by. I watch the fishery. I've been doing it for 50 years out there. And there's about 50 to 75 old timers because we all started together. And, and the, the amount of Jacks that end up at Sats Up Springs and Bingham, and they go to surplus is it, it's it's unbelievable and i think that we ought to have a a, a crack at them uh, we were the first river uh, system in the state to allow two rods on a river i would like to be the first river system to get our limit on jacks uh, increased it's i've talked to people who've been here 50 years nobody even knows how long that six limit is and, and why it can't be increased when we have these runs that aren't good for anything other than surplus. It just blows me away. And you'd sell more licenses. I mean, if you don't want, I mean, I, I, they fought me on two rods and, and I don't know how much dollar they make on two, or two rod endorsement, but all the people uh, that fish them, they love them. Even people that said, Osborne, you're crazy. I mean, uh, one rod's enough. I see them fishing two rods now. But back to the jacks, see what you can do about talking to whoever you got to talk to. Get the limit on jacks increased. Uh, again, I've mentioned before, Oregon doesn't even want any jacks in the system. You don't even have to punch them in Oregon. And, and and we're still doing the things we've done for 
umpteen years. And again, it's only sportsmen that want them. The gill netters don't want them. The tribe doesn't want them. Let us have some. Thank you very much. Hey, hey Bill. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, thanks for your comments. Just a little sidebar note here. Uh, first time we've we've met, um, and from my perspective, just on this initial interaction, uh, Dave's got nothing on you, partner. <laughs> Appreciate the comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Hey, Leah, maybe I'll just say real quick, Bill, yeah. James here. I was on the call last night. Um, so was Marlene and Kelly and a, a group of us here on the Willapa Bay meeting. So you got a close connection here between the Willapa and Grace Harbor proposal. So we're hearing what you're saying in terms of Willapa too. So thanks for flagging that for us. And our next hand is from Melanie. Melanie, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, it's Bob. I just had a comment about Bill's proposal for increasing the number of jacks. Isn't that going to increase the number of encounters with adults that have to be released in that system? And how is that going to affect the overall number if you increase the impacts from August 1st through September 15th? Certainly that could increase impacts. Um, there aren't a lot of adults in the river that time of uh, that time of the year. I will say that as you get later in the season when adults are, are, are allowed to be harvested, um, as soon as you get your adult limit, you're done. Doesn't matter how many jacks are still left on the limit. So uh, on, when you cannot keep an adult, then it potentially could increase the uh, impacts of adult fish. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify that. And that was our last hand again. So just to remind people, if you're on the phone, um, to raise your hand is star nine. And if you're having trouble finding it on your screen, it's in the reactions tab. And we have Dave's hand back up. Dave, you can unmute. I guess I just have a question. I mean, uh, there be, as uh, we all have this kind of a <laughs> little trail of stuff, people talking and do a bunch of us old geezers and stuff. So, but my question really is, is um, uh, the jack fishery, yeah, you can have it, you're gonna encounter some adults, I got that. But when uh, the number of, of adults that are present and the number that you encounter, even the guys when they're fishing, uh, they don't encounter that many jacks. Uh, none of us do. I mean, that many adults. Uh, you're like more likely to tangle with a coho, uh, uh, I mean, a, a Chinook adult than a coho one at times early on. So, but but to 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 Bill saying about the limit, uh, I mean, the six jacks. I really would like an answer to that question myself. I've been beat up by that question over the years about 50 times. And just where did that six come, that number six come from? You know, I mean, uh, it must have some bearing on something. And number two is, is just say you did an Oregon thing, uh, no limit, or say it's 12 jacks. Well, just exactly, I realize you're bound to mathematically encounter other fish, but exactly how many? I mean, it's just kind of like uh, I got into one of agency staff some time ago about an issue. And he says, well, we got to quit doing this and that because they're harassing the spring Chinook. And I says, well, exactly how much of an effect does this happen? One or 10 or 100? or 1,000, how many fish is dying because of this activity? So when you say six jacks instead of more, and if you have more, you're going to counter more adults, I won't argue with anybody. But I'll ask you the question, how many? If, is it one, 100, 1,000? If you're saying that a, a person, Bill and the, the guys fishing the skinny water, and they can keep 12 
jacks. Now, let's say that's what we're going to do. Okay, is that going to double the interaction between others? Okay, let's say it does. Exactly how many is that? Not that it happens. What is the actual effect? And it's, I, I come to this for a reason because Mike actually taught me this. When we were talking about the jack fishery and stuff, there have been things thrown our way. And Mike took the time to go back through the history and found out that even when we had a spring Chinook season, come July, there weren't many springers around. Okay. In other words, the jack fishery didn't have any effect on the springers if you did it right. And it didn't have that much of an effect on the fall Chinook. So we have a jack fishery. But Mike quantified that by going back through the records the best he could, what, what you had to, to accomplish that. And I'm simply saying, if we're having six jack limit, what is the purpose of it? Okay. Two, if you raise it, what is the cause and effect? Does it mean we're going to have two more dead coho adults or five or 100 or three Chinook? I mean, there has to be a reason other than perspective. And I'm saying that six jack rule was made someplace and it, it's, it doesn't apply. It, it's not applicable. It doesn't match up to the river. It doesn't match up to the circumstances. It doesn't match up to anything. And then the validation of why it's there, <laughs> like Melody brought up, uh, you'll interact and maybe have more mortalities. Okay, how many more? And is this going to take us off the river two weeks early? Or is what's it, I mean, what is the effect? And I'm just saying Bill's point of a rule being put in place and running on autopilot without no validation is not a good rule. There has to be something that's sorted out so people understand why you're doing it and how come. Okay. So if I may jump in, I cannot address where six fish came from. Uh, I can address that it's the highest limit in any water, freshwater body in the state. Um, so it's, it's pretty liberal to begin with. And if we have the data that shows during August and September, when we had adult harvest opportunity, those numbers can easily be translated into catch and release numbers. So those numbers can be done. Um, I'm, it's and just some assumptions thing. can be made. So it, it can be done, um, but it is noted and uh, we can take a look at it. I think it'd only be fair to the guys that fish there. I fish jacks, okay, but uh, I'm not quite as fanatical about them. Uh, but uh, I'm just saying it's a rule uh, that hasn't got validation and a rule needs to have a purpose and a thought behind it and a goal is trying to achieve. And if you got a rule, it's just a rule that doesn't do any of those three, it's a rule that shouldn't be there. It has no purpose. Hey, uh, I, I like the discussion on jacks here. Um, I also wanna keep us moving without completely throwing out the six fish jack limit. Um, so in certain places, particularly around hatcheries, we know um, we have a high proportion of jacks in the river and we have folks that um, are pretty excited about targeting them. So there are places where a six fish uh, jack rule makes sense. We can see that with catch record card data where we see a, num a large number of jacks caught by anglers, but not adults. So these are places folks are really benefiting from this rule. So I do like the idea of digging into it deeper river by river and trying to understand if there's places where um, a large number of jack encounters are also resulting in an increased number of adults. But um, I do know there's, there's folks that really appreciate that six fish, specifically six fish jack rule. Um, so yeah, it's a good one for us to take a note on and, and look deeper at. Uh, so thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Actually, it's a, if, <laughs> the reason Bill likes to fish, and the guys do, I'm an old guy who used to fish Rainbow in D.C. when I was young. And if you catch jacks, the way you eat them is simply smoke them just like you would a rainbow trout. And it's absolutely probably the best eating coho there is. It's, they're, it's really a good fish to eat. Most people want big fish. Eh, 
Yeah, if you're just after quality, there's it's hard to beat a jack straight out of the ocean. They're just good eating. I don't need any more food, though. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And that was our last hand for right now. Um, go to star nine on your if you're on your phone or at the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen. Marlene, it looks like that might be it. Thank you, Leah. Thank you everybody out there who provided us uh, your ideas and questions and comments. We really appreciate it. Um, I'll just do my little spiel here at the end. Uh, if you want to make any additional North of Falcon comments, very welcome to do so. Um, and here's the link to do that electronically. Um, and also, if you're not a member of our Grace Harbor distribution list and you would like to be, please send us an email at this address, graceharbor at wdfw.wa.gov. Um, we're going to look forward to seeing you again on uh, April 19th. We have a joint Willow Bay and Grace Harbor uh, uh, fisheries meeting uh, at that date uh, from six to eight. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Stay in touch. Thank you. <laughs>